I received a letter today from someone who was having a problem with his inner critic, basically asking, how do you get the inner critic to shut up? That's not the solution. We all need an inner critic to pass judgment on what we're doing as we practice, to get an idea of what's going to be helpful and what's not going to be helpful. The problem is our inner critic was trained by somebody else, not by the Buddha. It was trained by the mass media, trained by our parents, by our friends, by our teachers. The internet, internet, internet. Lots of different conflicting standards of value. And it's possible to be criticized from the point of view of any standard of value. In other words, you do something and one set of values will say it's good, but another will say it's wrong. Then you try to please the second, and the first set of values will say, no, that's wrong. What you need to do is get the Buddha to train your inner critic, the one who passes judgment on things, to let you know what's skillful and what's not skillful. This is a theme that runs all the way through the practice from the very beginning up to the highest levels. In the beginning we work with generosity and virtue, and we want to be clear about what we're doing when we're in line with our precepts and when we're not. I got another phone call this, this morning from someone who, had, in a fit of real anger, had intentionally killed a mosquito, even though it was a very small animal. The fact that since she had intentionally killed it scared her. She talked to some of her Dharma friends and they said, oh, don't think so much about it. You probably didn't mean to. She said, well, I did mean to. And the friends who were trying to make her feel good were trying to anesthetize her inner critic. But then that means your precepts start getting sloppy, and when your precepts are sloppy, then your concentration gets sloppy. Your discernment gets dishonest. So you have to start training the critic. And it begins with very basic meditation instructions. The passage where the Buddha tells Rahula, Try to make your mind like earth. Bad things are dumped on the earth, but the earth doesn't react. You extend it to say that perfumes can be poured on the earth, the earth isn't pleased. We're often told that we try to make the mind non-reactive and non-judging, but it's more making it non-reactive so you can judge more clearly. In other words, you learn to see negative things inside you, and you don't get upset, you don't get whirled up about them, except the fact that they're there. And then ask yourself in a matter-of-fact way, what can I do about them? You do recognize that they're unskillful, but you're not knocked over by that fact. If you get knocked over, it means that your sense of self has gotten in the way. You don't like to see unskillful things in yourself, so you try to hide them which is not going to get rid of them. You have to have the mental solidity to say, yeah, there are unskillful things in my mind. So now what do I do about them? Because you have to have confidence in the Buddhist teachings that the tools he gives you can deal with those negative voices, can deal with the negative things going on in your mind. in a skillful way. Then we further train our mindfulness in this way. The Buddha said one of the functions of mindfulness on the path is to remember what right view tells you about what's right and what's wrong, what's skillful and what's not. And then you use your ability to keep that in mind to direct your efforts, get rid of what's unskillful and to encourage what's skillful. Think of the image of the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper doesn't just sit there watching people coming in and going out. He's not a people watcher. He's not like the mannequin policeman that one scholar once said, 
mindfulness functions as. In other words, the fact that there's mindfulness sitting at the gate means that your unskillful mental states are afraid to go in, in the fortress. But if the gatekeeper just sits there and watches whoever comes in goes out, it's not going to intimidate anybody. It's like driving past a mannequin policeman. The first time you see him, you might slow down. But then you notice that's not a person, that's a mannequin. From that point on, you can ignore it with impunity. It's the same with your defilements. If you don't do something about your defilements, they're going to come in and take over the place. Because remember, that fortress is on the frontier, where there are enemies. Things are actually bad for your mind. You've got to learn how to recognize them. Make sure they don't come in. Because remember, mindfulness is coupled with alertness, then it informs ardency, which again is right effort. So you block the unskillful things as best you can. As the Buddha said, this is what mindfulness does. It blocks them. And then discernment is what uproots them, gets rid of them totally. But for the ability to judge things clearly as to what they are and what they're not, You've got to get the mind in a non-reactive state. Because there are times when people coming into the fortress may look like friends, but they're not. They can dress themselves up and disguise themselves in all kinds of ways. Laziness in particular can dress itself up like the Dharma. You can say, well, the Buddha said, you follow the middle way. At least to a sense of ease. So the path itself should be easeful too. But then you think of all the paths you've encountered in the world. And there are a lot of paths that go to really beautiful spots, spots where you can rest, gaze out across a beautiful landscape. But getting there is not easy. There's a famous spot in the French Alps where photographers like to go. And they get spectacular pictures of Mont Blanc. But getting there requires hours and hours of climbing vertical surfaces. And you have to be really fit to get there. It's just not the case that a path to an easeful goal has to be easeful too. Or sometimes we're told, don't think that you're doing the path, the path is doing itself. Because if you think you're doing the path, then you believe that there's a self, and that's a wrong view. Well, the path doesn't get done that way, or whatever happens to get done. It depends entirely on your past good karma. Your present karma is not contributing anything at all, and that's not going to get you very far. So you do have to have a provisional sense of you as being responsible for the path. And it's the fact that you are competent to do it and that you will benefit. This is why the Buddha talks about the self as its mainstay, the self as a governing principle. And even when he has Rula talk to himself about looking at his actions, it's always this action that I'm about to do, the action I, I want to do, the action I am doing, the action I have done. I, I, I. You're responsible. You're an agent. Now that you get to the point at the end when you can put the agent down because it is a strategy. But you've got to use it along the way. So watch out for these voices that tell you to just the path is one of ease. And if you push yourself too hard, it's not the path. Of course, pushing yourself too hard is not the path. But what does too hard mean? You're not going to know until you push yourself. Think of the image of the getting the milk out of the cow. You twist the horn and you don't get any milk. Then you stop twisting the horn and you say, this is much more easeful. But you still don't get any milk. Remember the Buddha's definition of beings is that we're feeding on things. This is what defines us. And we're not going to stop feeding as we get on the path. We have to continue feeding. We can't tell ourselves, well, I'll just tell myself not to eat anymore and I'll be okay. You're going to starve, and it's going to be painful. 
you're going to go back and feed some more. So you want to learn how to feed well. Train your inner critic to be a connoisseur. What kind of feeding is skillful and what kind of feeding is not? What sense of self is skillful and what sense of self is not? And keeping in mind that you do have these choices. And you need to train your inner critic, because after all, a lot of the path is about value judgments. When Venerable Sariputta said that the main message of the Buddha's teachings was the ending of passion and desire. Well, this passion is a value judgment, that the processes of fabrication that we do are not worth it. And before we get there, though, we have to learn how to fabricate the path and to judge what's on the path and what's off the path. There's a right path and there's a wrong path. The causes of suffering that we do respond to simply looking at them with equanimity. But there are others that respond only when you fabricate a fabrication. And to do both of those processes well, you've got to develop good powers of concentration. Think about the Buddhist teachings on equanimity. There's ordinary equanimity, which is what we start out with. That's the equanimity of training the mind to be like earth. But you can't stop there to make the mind solid enough so that when it looks at something, it's not tempted to go for it. It has to have a sense of well-being. This is the type of equanimity the Buddha recommends. It's either the well-being that comes from concentration or the well-being that when you see that, when you let go of something, it really does lift a burden off the mind. But you've got to work on the concentration first to get the kind of equanimity that can look at things and see right through them, not be tempted to go for them. As for fabrication, the Buddha talks about three kinds, bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily is your in and out breath. Verbal is how you talk to yourself. Mental is the perceptions you hold in mind, the labels you put on things, and the feelings that you focus on. These are the elements that go into how you shape your present experience. And where are you going to learn about these things? Through the practice of concentration. You focus on the breath, bodily fabrication, and you talk to yourself about it to make it comfortable, verbal fabrication. You hold perceptions in mind that allow the breath to give rise to a feeling of ease, mental fabrication. It's by getting hands-on experience with these processes that you can do them well. So both ways of approaching the causes of suffering, passing skillful judgment on them, require that you work on developing concentration. So this is how you train your inner critic to be helpful in these activities, to pass judgment in a way that doesn't debilitate you. And that's the main problem with the, most people's inner critic. Passes judgment and leaves no room for improvement. Passes judgment and leaves no room for believing that you can actually do something right. The inner critic has to be trained that it is possible to put an end to suffering and you can do it. You have to be responsible, but you are capable, and you really will benefit. Because that's the other part of the, the bad inner critic, is saying, well, no matter how hard you try, it's, it's going to be a waste, so don't even bother. That inner critic has to be banished. And you place it not with an uncritical mind, but with a more skillfully critical mind. Starting with teaching yourself to be non-reactive, that you can see unskillful things in, in you and you don't get worked up about them. You recognize them as unskillful and then you try to be very matter-of-fact in overcoming them. So that's how non-reactivity functions. It's a support not for a non-judging mind, but for a skillfully judging mind. 
one that knows how to pass judgment in a way that leads to the end of suffering. And when its work is done, then you can put it down. But you get rid of it, not because you hate it, but because it's done all it can for you, and you can part ways. <laughs>